This is Bishop Michael Burbage, and you are listening to the Walk Humbly Podcast. Welcome to the Walk Humbly Podcast. I'm Billy Atwell, Chief Communications Officer for the Diocese and your co-host. If you haven't already, please make sure you rate this podcast and write a review wherever you're listening. And don't forget, we're on Spotify now as well. Sign up for our e-newsletter at arlingtondiocese.org, and you can follow Bishop Burbage on Twitter, almost 17,000 of you already do, at Bishop Burbage. You can also follow the Diocese on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Send questions for this podcast to info at arlingtondiocese.org. Again, questions for Bishop Burbage go to info at arlingtondiocese.org. I welcome your host, Bishop Burbage. Bishop, how are you? I'm doing well, Billy. Thank you. Uh, it's a great time of year in our diocese. So many exciting things going on. I'm doing uh, a great deal of visits to our schools, celebrating Masses of Holy Spirit. That's right. Uh, asking Holy Spirit to, to bless all of our students and their faculties and uh, their families. So it's a, it's a great time of year, beautiful time of year, too, that uh, God has given us. We've had so many beautiful days lately. I hope everyone's enjoying them and um, being refreshed and renewed. Absolutely. So we're recording this on a feast that you uh, were talking about just a little bit earlier. Right, yeah. Today we're recording this on the feasts of Saints Cosmas and Damien, martyrs, yeah. uh, who are the patrons of uh, physicians, surgeons, and pharmacists. And I was thinking this morning that, you know, so often uh, those entrusted with our medical care, including nurses and physician assistants, uh, those in hospice work, uh, so often those entrusted with our medical care are people that uh, we can often just take for granted right? Uh, and not realizing the great responsibilities that God has given to them each and every day. Uh, I know that when my mother was in a health care and facility, whenever a, a nurse or a physician assistant or doctor would leave, she would often say to them, what will we do without you? Yeah, that's and true. And it's so very true. So I know when people ask me to pray for them, you know, Bishop, please pray for me. I'm going to have surgery. I always say, oh, I will. And I'm also going to be praying uh, for those entrusted with your medical care. So maybe today's a great day for us to give thanks to God for those he has entrusted with our medical care, ask him to bless them so that they will be instruments of his healing love, and, and a word of thanks to all those uh, who are instruments uh, of the Lord in the medical professions. God bless you. Very good. Uh, before we get into the main topics, I want to ask, uh, you know, this coming Sunday is World Day for Migrants and Refugees, and, and you issued a statement, and in the statement you said, our Catholic faith challenges us to respond to the plight of our brothers and sisters by welcoming them in our midst, by welcoming, training, equipping, and integrating into our community refugees and migrants. We manifest our common human dignity and our need to be one as children of a loving God. It's very powerful. As we approach this day, what do you want people to be thinking about and praying about? It's a big issue. What would you want them to focus Right. And just uh, even the, the quote you just read is uh, just as consistent uh, with who we are as Catholics. Uh, we are always uh, promoters of the gospel of life, uh, which is that all of life is holy and thus every person is worthy uh, of, of dignity and respect. Uh, and so everything about the Catholic Church, the gospel of life, is consistent. And so it is with our care for migrants and, and refugees. Uh, refugees uh, are very unique in that they are, uh, both have endured an incredible hardship and danger. Their stories are just, I mean, to hear their stories, it's, it's just amazing what they've been through, which have, has caused them to flee. Uh, and they've gone through an incredible multi-year vetting process, uh, refugees, to get into this uh, country. And so in this diocese, we've helped many Afghan refugees who are only refugees because they helped our military men and women during the war. So we should help them, right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah I was interviewing Bilane on Searching for More podcast, who runs our Migration Refugee Services. He's a migrant himself, which is or a, he's not a migrant, he's a refugee. Right. He came here from Ethiopia because he was uh, suffering government persecution. They were after him. And so he was able to become a refugee here in, a, in America, and now he's running the program. But he talked about these Afghan refugees, and you, you and I have both actually met some of these, these yeah. refugees over at... Um, the Migration Refugee Services, uh, Ministry of Catholic Charities. Fascinating stories and tragic. Most of them were helping our men and women right. in uniform as translators, and then they became targets themselves. Exactly right. And I'm very proud of, of so many of our parishes and businesses in our community who have been exactly what Christ calls us to do, uh, to be most welcoming. 
Uh, they have provided volunteers who help us welcome refugees at the airport. That's right. Provide backpacks for kids, uh, children attending school, diapers for their children, offer to teach English or provide material support. So this welcoming, uh, thank the good Lord, is going on uh, in our diocese and in our communities. And I do encourage our parishes and parishioners to reach out to Catholic Charities uh, Newcomer Services uh, to see how they can help to welcome the stranger in our midst uh, the stranger in our midst, uh, the refugee. So as we always say, catholiccharities.ccda.net, uh, maybe you, you are in a position to volunteer and be part of, of the welcoming that we should extend to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Absolutely. Bishop Ed, again, before we go into these topics, you, you uh, celebrated Mass recently for students at the University of Mary Washington, and you held a question and answer uh, afterward, very bold of you. Uh, what were some of the questions you got? What was the vibe of the students? Yeah, it's, uh, it's really great. I, I celebrate Mass at uh, Mary, uh, Mary Mount and uh, Mary Washington, George Mason, our campus ministry programs. And, you know, it's, that's, that's a great joy, and to see the faithful witness of these young students, these young men and women at Mass, uh, with no one watching, no right. one telling them <laughs> they have to go, but there they are, you know. Uh, and I always like to have time with them afterwards and to engage in questions and answers. I flipped it around a little bit this year, so I, I also had questions for them. So, oh. so the deal was, if you get to ask me a question, I get to ask you one. Well, I'd be I, curious what yours were yeah, also. Yeah, <laughs> so uh, we'll, we'll go through that uh, one of these days. But the responses were, were excellent. But what I'm hearing, basically, you know, if I could summarize uh, all of their questions come down to, um, how do I find the tools... Uh, and the strength uh, to live and to articulate uh, my faith uh, on this campus. Uh, and, and that's what evangelization is all about. You know, we know that the most important way that we uh, profess our faith um, is uh, through our example and through our witness that, that we give. Uh, you know, never, always to be proud of the faith that we profess. Uh, and to live it and to practice it no matter uh, the cost. And to show the joy, show the joy we have in, in living uh, the faith, embracing the gospel. Uh, but uh, I did hear consistently uh, from our students uh, how difficult this is on yeah. campuses. Um, uh, specifically, we were talking about Mary Washington, but I think they're reflective of what students experience uh, as I talk to many of our graduates, and, and sadly, also in Catholic universities and colleges, yeah, too. that's true. But, I mean, not only from their peers do they sometimes meet a resistance and harsh criticism and unfair labeling, but these students say also in the classroom, also in the classroom by with professors. Wow. Uh, forcing them to, uh, you know, uh, answer questions uh, by... Uh, really uh, denying what they believe. And I, a number of the students uh, said they, they'd rather have a, a failing grade in a paper uh, or in a test rather than just being uh, giving back to the professor what he or she wants to hear. Yeah, Is that an incredible example and witness from our young people? It is. It takes a lot of courage to right. do that. Yeah. And uh, so we are blessed with uh, wonderful uh, campus ministers at these universities, great priests, uh, who are daily accompanying our students. And, and I'll tell you, they're, they're strong, uh, but they have to be. Uh, and we're going to continue to uh, give them the tools to properly articulate our faith without compromise, but always, you know, in love. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we want to inspire uh, people to embrace our faith. So I, I believe they're in great hands with our campus ministers. And uh, certainly, you know, they know the importance of coming to the Lord for the help they need. That's wonderful. It's good to hear. So Bishop, for our first topic, a California woman who identifies as a transgender man has been cleared by the First District Court of Appeals to sue a Catholic hospital for not performing a hysterectomy, which is a sterilization. Performing such a pre procedure would obviously be contrary to the Church's deeply held belief that our gender is one of the many things inscribed in us by God and should not be undermined. The hospital, known as Dignity Health, went even so far as to reschedule the surgery at a secular Dignity Health hospital hospital within 72 hours of canceling, a move that you know many feel is inappropriate, but was showing that they were trying to accommodate in some way. Nevertheless, 
The woman has sued the Catholic hospital for not violating its beliefs. Uh, St. Joseph Health, a health system in California, is facing a similar lawsuit right now. And we're seeing other similar types of cases around the country. These are two examples yeah. of it. Uh, Bishop, this seems uh, like another instance of Christians really being bullied into deciding between facing an enormous lawsuit or the religious faith. What's your response when you see these kinds of stories? No, I think it is. Yeah. I think it is. Um, and this obviously goes far beyond a medical inconvenience, um, whether the hospital has the right to deny an elective procedure, right? right. Uh, so this gets down to the core issue of whether or not Catholics are allowed to practice their faith in society. Uh, I mean, yeah, that's, that's the core issue. That's a good point. Uh, and this is, uh, sadly, Billy, uh, this is not the last fight of this nature we will face. Uh, there are, I've talked to brother bishops throughout around the country. They are uh, fighting it, and, and the direction we're heading is th this is where we're going. I mean, this is very, very concerning. Uh, Catholic medical systems have been treated like, I believe, uh, uh, second-class institutions uh, whenever they stand by their convictions. And these are institutions uh, dedicated to, to God's healing love. Uh, you know? Yeah, it's, it, it's the way I, I see it is some, I think, from the outside might look at it and say, in spite of being Catholic, they've got this hospital. Right. It's because they're Catholic that exactly. they have a hospital like that. That's, it's out of that faith that generates the generosity to want to help the poor and to serve the sick. Well, no, that's true. And there, there, there is some good news, though. Um, uh, I, I was recently informed that our society believes in the right of religious institutions to stand by their convictions. Uh, USCCB, the Bishop's Conference, mm -hmm. uh, recently founded a, a third-party poll, so not right. a, an internal one, right. <laughs> about this. And they found that 83% of people, 83% of people support not forcing health care providers to violate their conscience. That's a large 83% is not small. That's good news. Yeah, that is, that is good. Because it's a pretty basic core issue. Right. Uh, right and right. it's regrettable to me uh, that while Catholic health systems fight to maintain their... Um, identity. Uh, you know, on the other hand, some politicians fight to ensure that abortion clinics, uh, you know, are not held to the standards, uh, yeah. you know, lower, th that they have lower health standards uh, and not, uh, you know, don't have the same expectation that other medical it's uh, so true. facilities. Yeah. So it's, it, there's just such a contradiction. Absolutely. Uh, so what do we need to do? Those 83 percent and more uh, have to raise our voices when we see these things happen, share this kind of story on social media, highlight uh, and, and expose the uh, harassment of Catholic institutions yeah. uh, whenever you see it. Um, so uh, this is a, going to be an ongoing battle, uh, but uh, it's one, you know, together uh, that we can uh, allow our voices and our positions to stand. And, and for those listening, for those who would like to better understand the political uh, issues at risk here, as well as to um, help participate in, in the fight back to res to maintain our our identity and our religious freedom, uh, go to vacatholic.org. You can sign up for the e-newsletter there and get alerts about these kinds of things when they happen in Virginia. There's also an event. You can RSVP for an event, Virginia in Jeopardy. It's being held at St. Elizabeth Ann's seat in Catholic Church, which is in Lake Ridge, right here in our diocese, so you don't have to go too far. It's on September 28th. It starts at 9.45 a.m. with a 9 a.m. Mass beforehand, if you can make it. Again, that's on September 28th. Go to vacatholic.org. Come learn how you can defend religious freedom. There's a, a really tragic and, and grisly story, actually, out of South Bend, Indiana, uh, but it's it's made huge headlines. 2,200 aborted babies were found in the basement of the home of a now-deceased abortionist, Ulrich Klopfer. Uh, this news has been met with outrage and demands, obviously, for uh, authorities to investigate and find out what happened here, because there are state laws that were violated, but somehow he was able to do this. But it's clear that more needs to be done to care for the, the bodies of the deceased, these deceased children. We've seen a lot of rallies in Indiana and really around the country even about this. It's, it's a horrifying revelation. It is horrifying, Billy. Uh, I mean, it's, it's so, so sad and so unsettling, uh, to say the least. Uh, but we should not be surprised. Uh, that someone who's willing to kill thousands upon thousands of babies uh, would also be careless in how he handled the babies. That's true. I mean, that's true. tragically, that's just it's one follows stretch, the other. Right. Um, as Catholics, uh, we believe that bodies, you know, uh, should be buried or the remains should be buried. Um, this is an ancient right that we uh, practice to recognize the dignity of the person who died as well as the dignity uh, of their body. Uh, we believe that we will be raised up gloriously. Uh, when Christ returns, mm. as St. Paul uh, writes, 
Uh, one of the women uh, who spoke at the press conference uh, related uh, to the abortionist who had the bodies of babies in his basement was a woman uh, who had an abortion by him at the age of 13. Wow. Uh, she, like so many women who have abortions, uh, often you know, uh, regret that yeah. decision and spend their lifetime healing. And the Catholic Church is always there, especially through Project Rachel, to help women That's true. in that healing process. We stand with them to help them in that healing process because we know that God's mercy and love are greater than any sin. Uh, she testified that her baby may be one of the babies found in the basement. Imagine that. Uh, it, I can't it, imagine. As a yeah. parent, I cannot imagine. So already pain. regretting that, that poor horrific decision, through. and now just complicated. Yeah. Um, so this is a reminder, Billy, of the uh, gruesome tragedy of abortion, uh, not only what it does to babies, but also what it does to their mothers and, and mm. fathers. Uh, I ask everyone uh, to pray for children killed at the hands of an abortionist. Please also pray for their mothers, their fathers, that they will seek Christ, uh, his mercy, and his consolation. Absolutely. Very, very good. Um, turning to a, a much more positive story, uh, Bishop, uh, some great news. Uh, our own Holy Martyrs of Vietnam Catholic Church is celebrating 40 years as a parish. You recently uh, attended the anniversary mass and festivities. Uh, what was that like? Well, it was, all, it was a joyful, joyful celebration. Of course, I told the people that, you know, the greatest privilege is being with them around the altar to celebrate God's love and word and sacrament. But I did also admit there are two other reasons I love coming to their parish is, uh, number one, the beautiful music, and the other other one is the food. I was going to say, the, the food. food's got to be in there somewhere. It's really good. <laughs> it's really good. Uh, so what, it, what a celebration of faithfulness. Uh, uh, you know, we are so blessed with uh, distinct communities, multicultural communities within our diocese, each uh, bringing uh, gifts uh, in very unique way. Uh, on, uh, at the Holy Martyrs of Vietnam Parish, we saw such joy, uh, such zeal uh, for the faith. We're so blessed to have them. And such a, uh, a, a real uh, devotion to family life. I mean, it's true, yeah. It was, uh, everyone's, the whole families, families were together. Uh, so it's, you know, uh, the number of them, uh, parishioners who fled Vietnam and established a home here again, some of their stories are incredible. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but they've been enriched me and they've inspired me. And I, I want to thank our new pastor who I installed that evening, too. We also had the installation. It was a packed of, evening. Yeah, of a new pastor, Father Joseph, uh, for uh, being such a, a good shepherd. That's wonderful. Yeah, when we I've gone to the... Um uh, the multicultural mass. Uh, it's wonderful to see all these cultures represented. You know, the Vietnamese community is always there in, in force, and they bring you know the food and the the, the uh, traditional dress and those kinds of things. Yes. But they show up at every major yeah, diocesan oh, event. They they really are are great about being part of the the overall community, but representing their own traditions well. Right. Absolutely. So, Bishop, we've got a couple questions from the uh, younger parishioners of our diocese. So, one was a. Um, uh, Anthony, he's from Holy Family. He's a teen that went to work camp. So his question is, how do you go about telling someone not to judge others? He mentioned that he has a friend who's a little judgmental, okay. and he wants to know how to talk to him about it. Well, you could always quote Jesus. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not a bad start. <laughs> I mean, it's the Lord who tells us, Anthony, uh, not to judge. So, uh, we, you know, all you're doing is sharing the words of Jesus himself, uh, who tells us uh, not to judge. And of course, one of the reasons the Lord tells us that is because uh, we, he's the only one who can look into the hearts of, of his people. We can't have any understanding of what is going on in someone's heart, uh, what is going on in someone's life, uh, right. the situations that they're dealing with. Uh, we can only see the externals. Mm -hmm. And it's, 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 it's not right for us uh, to judge only by the externals. Um, and so the Lord said, stop wasting time and energy doing that. Instead, look within, mm. look within, and we'll all find enough work to do there. Right. Uh, what right. has to change in our lives. Uh, and if we devote our time and energy to that, we won't even have time to judge others. Yeah. And I, I, for young people, I, a lot of times, especially in popular culture, 
when they say, you know, don't judge, that means don't tell me what I'm doing is wrong. Right, yeah. Which is different. There are right. moral absolutes. You know, the circumstances of the person's life doesn't yeah. change the morality of what they're doing. Right. But yeah. it does change maybe how you approach them. Right. First in love, right. not in, you know, condemnation necessarily. Right. Yeah, you're, that's a good point that you're making. If certainly we can discern, uh, you know, what is right and what is wrong, mm -hmm. what is good and holy and what is not. Uh, you know, uh, behavior, conduct. There are some things we accept. There are some things we don't reject. But we don't, uh, we don't judge uh, the person. We judge. Yeah, the heart of we the person. We can react yeah. and respond to the decision and those things too. Yeah. Uh, but entrust the person uh, to the care and mercy and love of God. Absolutely. Wonderful. All right, so the next is uh, Harrison. He's uh, 11 years old right here at St. Thomas More Cathedral. And he says, can you see in heaven? Uh, <laughs> that's a great <laughs> this question. This is getting back to like uh, probably early seminary <laughs> days for you, the, the yeah. basics of theology. Yeah. <laughs> that's a great question. <laughs> but can you see in heaven? All right, Harrison, I, I we guess I, we should just go back to the Apostles' Creed, I guess. Uh, I believe in the resurrection of the body. Mm -hmm. uh, therefore, we celebrate that uh, both the body... Uh, that both the immortal soul will live on after death and our mortal body will come to life again at the end of time. So uh, the resurrection of the body means our whole bodies will be remade perfect. And so I'm thinking uh, that's including eyes that see and ears that hear. That's wonderful. But I think Harrison brings us to a, uh, a good reminder, though, too, um, is the goal that we all share. Um, you know, this, this life here on earth uh, is just a journey. Uh, and we all are heading uh, to the same ultimate goal and destination. That's life with God forever in heaven. So every day we should be prepared to meet the Lord uh, and help others, um, you know, along that path. And, you know, for the adults listening, we want your questions, but we want your, your kids' questions too. You know, we, we would love to hear, you know, from more kids like Harrison. Um, you know, even these simple questions can be very illuminating for people and, and you know, remind them of a larger truth about who we are as Catholics. So feel free to send those in. Again, that's info at arlingtondiocese.org if you want to share a question from yourself or from your child. Um, Bishop, any, any final thoughts, or um, and if you would also send us off with your, your final blessing. Right. Uh, no, just a, um, a thank you for all the people who are listening to our podcast. It's always a, a great uh, privilege to be able to commun communicate with you. Uh, you know, October we will be celebrating Respect Life Month. Uh, so it's, it's a wonderful opportunity to uh, give thanks to God and never take for granted the very gift of life itself, uh, to remember that Christ is alive, he's within you, you are a temple of the Holy Spirit, and so is everyone else you meet and see, and so we treat each other uh, with that respect and, and dignity. And October is going to be a great month. We uh, have our Respect Life Month, our uh, wedding anniversary uh, mass celebration for those celebrating 25th and 50th, our homeschool mass coming up. So I hope our listeners are, uh, you know, on our social media and our diocesan website to know these great events that will be occurring in October. I do ask God to bless all our listeners and their loved ones and families so that we will have the grace each and every day to walk humbly with our God. Thank you for listening to the Walk Humbly podcast. Make sure you check out more episodes on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and Spotify. You can follow me on Twitter at Bishop Burbage, where I offer gospel reflections each morning and share photos and updates of what is going on in the Diocese of Arlington. Stay up to date with news, event information, and inspirational content by subscribing to our e-newsletter at arlingtondiocese.org.